Welcome one and all to Festival Bloomsday Montreal 2020 online. I'm Kathleen Fee, Vice President of Bloomsday Montreal, and I'll be hosting a few of the events over the next five days. This is a new experience, a new medium, and everyone is adjusting. Organizers like ourselves, performers, readers, academics, and audience members like you. All right, so uh, what, uh, what I want to do now is to um, uh, welcome you, as I said, <laughs> to this opening event. And the first thing I'd like to do, just let me get my script organized here, so I don't want to forget anything. That would be a disaster. So the first thing I'd like to do is acknowledge that Bloomsday Montreal is based on the unceded indigenous territory of Jojage and that the Gunyagehaga, or Mohawk Nation, is the custodian of the lands and waters. Next, our sponsors, without whom we would not be here. We received major support from the Government of Canada, the Embassy of Ireland, the Atwater Library, the Westmount Public Library, the Jewish Public Library, Concordia University School of Irish Studies, McGill University, and the McGill Community for Lifelong Learning, uh, also the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network, uh, the Zeller Family Foundation, Celtic Life International, Jameson Irish Whiskey, Murphy's Irish Stout, and individual donors. To all, thank you. I'd also like to thank Geroyd O'Halveran for permission to use his fabulous music. Professor O'Halveran is an ethnomusicologist, author, musician, and historian. His album, Traditional Music from Clare and Beyond, is available for download from iTunes. We have an exciting lineup of events spread out over five days. A celebration of Irish culture, world literature, and the universality of human experience. Please go to our website to check it all out and register. And now, I am delighted to introduce the president of Festival Bloomsday Montreal, Kevin Wright. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 version of Bloomsday. To the Irish, to whom you are related, is important. Ge genealogy is important. It helps sort out relationships and lets you know where you stand. I remember as a child, meeting my father's cousins and being asked, who do you belong to? When names and family ties were exchanged, they knew how to react. Some of you may already know something of Bloomsday's genealogy, but for many, it's not quite as clear. Some may know that visitors to Dublin should not be surprised to see people walking around the streets with a copy of Ulysses in hand, as well as a guidebook. The high point in the year for this wandering is June 16th. Others may know nothing. So let me tell you a bit about who we belong to. June 16th, 1904 is the date on which James Joyce finally got to go out with Nora Barn. She'd stood him up a day or so earlier, so he made an appointment for the 16th. And so June 16th became immortalized as the setting of the events in Ulysses. The very first celebration of Bloomsday was held as a Ulysses lunch organized by Sylvia Beach and Adrienne Monnier in 1929. Joyce loved it. He loved being. The next time we hear about Bloomsday is in 1954, when John Ryan, Patrick Kavanaugh, and Flann O'Brien decided to commemorate the day by visiting the Martello Tower in Sandy Cove, Davy Burns Pub, and Number 7 Hill Street, and other locations along the way. They intended to read aloud extracts from Ulysses, but needless to say, they didn't get very far 
since they stopped in at several pubs along the way. In 1962, John Ryan, who also owned the Bailey Pub, reinstated the celebration of Bloomsday. By this time, number seven, Eccles Street, the residence of Leopold Bloom and his wife Molly, was in a derelict state and was scheduled to be demolished. Ryan decided to try to negotiate with the nuns who had an option on the property to buy the door to the place. When the Reverend Mother heard that the place had Joycean associations, she asked in a glacial tone, is that the pagan writer? The qualms of the sisters were assuaged when Ryan took out his checkbook and made a sizable donation towards their missionary work. The door found a new home in his pub and became one of the stops on the Bloomsday Pilgrimage Road. The door has since moved on to the James Joyce Center at 35 North Great Georgia Street in Dublin. In 2011, after David Sherman finished leading a study group on Ulysses at the McGill Community for Lifelong Learning, the group asked why there wasn't a Bloomsday Festival in Montreal. The late Gus O'Gorman had organized readings on Bloomsday years earlier at Hurley's. With his blessing and cooperation, the newly revived Bloomsday Festival began its life. After a few years, Festival Bloomsday Montreal was granted the status of a nonprofit charitable organization whose mission was and still is the promotion of Irish culture in Montreal and its surrounded by sponsoring local artists, storytellers, and other talented people to perform at events in venues all over the city. In time, we have become the second biggest blue day in the world to Dublin. Here we are today, launching our ninth edition, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, by sailing out into the whole new universe of cyberspace. So that is, is in brief, who we belong to. We hope that you'll stay with us for the next few days as we become part of the worldwide celebration of Leopold Bloom's wanderings through the streets of James Joyce's Dublin. It is now my honor to introduce the founder and principal of Concordia University School of Irish Studies, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary. Dr. Michael Keneally is a specialist in modern and contemporary Irish literature, as well as 19th century writing by Irish Canadian immigrants. His interest is in novels, short stories, memoirs, diaries, and letters. He is the author of Sean O'Casey and the Art of Autobiography, and has published articles on Yeats, Joyce, and George Moore. He's the former editor of the Canadian Journal of Irish Studies. He has been a staunch supporter of Bloomsday Montreal since its inception. He and his wife, Rona Richmond Keneally, were chosen last year to receive the Presidential Disservice Award for the Irish Abroad. The press release announcing the award stated in part, Dr. Michael Keneally, and Dr. Rona Richmond Keneally, working in tandem, have dedicated much of their lives to promoting Irish educational interests in Canada, most notably through the foundation of the School of Irish Studies in Montreal at Concordia University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, in this era of personal distancing, as close as we can get to them, our opening speaker, the Honorary Consul General of Ireland, Dr. Michael Keneally. 
Thank you very much, Kevin, for those uh, kind words. I appreciate them. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Montreal's ninth annual Bloomsday Festival. I trust you are all well and safe, and I thank you for joining this virtual James Joyce experience. Let me begin by thanking and acknowledging the members of the Bloomsday under the leadership of Kevin and with the assistance of Kathleen for their indefatigable commitment and enthusiasm for forging ahead with Bloomsday celebrations in this extraordinary time. They are to be commended for insisting that the show must go on. We at the School of Irish Studies have been involved with Bloomsday Montreal since the beginnings, providing various forms of support and in particular, hosting the public lectures and academic presentations that are central to discussions of Joyce in general and Ulysses in particular. I would also like to thank our student, Miles Murphy, for continuing this liaison between Bloomsday and the School of Irish Studies by organizing the events, especially the academic discussions. As most of you will know, the School of Irish Studies has offered a course dedicated solely to James Joyce for many years. And I'm very pleased to let you know that Professor Andre Ferlani of Concordia's English department will offer it again in January 2021. Last fall, the school was honored to have Professor John McCourt, one of the preeminent scholars of Joyce, to offer the course on Ulysses. And when he came to Concordia and was a visitor under the auspices of the Peter O'Brien Visiting Scholar. We're all delighted in Montreal that Professor McCourt, who is the director of the Trieste James Joyce Summer School, is returning to Montreal, at least virtually, to give the keynote lecture of our Bloomsday celebrations. I'm not going to give a lecture this year, but I would like to share some thoughts with you arising out of reflections on Joyce's work during this pandemic, when we are all undergoing the strange experience of lockdown and social isolation. I'm sure that we all agree that two of the most striking features of our social isolation are its temporal open-endedness and the physical limitations on our movements. Both of these features of our current lives underline the unknowable, invisible, and possibly ubiquitous nature of the enemy against which we are contending. Immobilized, frozen in a static stance, we have no obvious path of action that might defeat it. Reflecting on Joyce's writing while contending with these circumstances, I thought we might derive added nuances of appreciation of Ulysses and perhaps glean any pertinent resonances between the world created in the novel and our own pandemic circumstances whether these insights are salutary or otherwise. To begin with, it is noteworthy that Joyce was writing Ulysses when the 1918-1919 Spanish flu suddenly appeared and before it had run its course, had claimed anywhere from 50 to 100 million victims. As we know also, Joyce began Ulysses in 1914, so much of the work was written throughout the First World War. It is interesting that historians have not yet provided a comprehensive historiography of the Spanish flu, its sources, its range, its consequences, partially, we suspect, because its horrors have been subsumed into and even identified with the suffering and the social dislocation and disintegration and extraordinary 
loss of life that were associated with the war itself. It is telling, I think, that in the midst of this quote, COVID pandemic, to read other works of literature which were written in this period. For example, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, published as we remember in 1922, the same year as Ulysses, is one of those texts. Reading The Wasteland with a, an awareness of the context of its composition, it is striking for the images it conjures up, not just of the collapse of society, of previous verities associated with religion, with cultural heritage, with sustaining traditions, as well as those institutions which before the war seemed familiar, knowable, and so solidly permanent. Not only does the wasteland reflect the forces that have caused the undermining and indeed collapse of these foundational blocks of Western culture, but in certain passages, it depicts the spectral world caused by the consequences of the Spanish flu pandemic. The flu itself spread like wildfire in the trenches of the Western Front, adding to the experience of carnage and death that was part of the soldier's reality. Certain reports of World War I speak of the unburied corpses and sickly figures that became the everyday experience of soldiers' worlds. They themselves inhabited a kind of in-between reality between life and death, in which dying and intimations of death became part of everyday consciousness. Now, Joyce did not necessarily have to wait until the World War I or the Spanish flu to become sensitive to the horrors of mass killings from such forces. We know from various people how superstitious Joyce was. And Sylvia Beach, whom Kevin just mentioned, for example, reported that he was afraid of thunderstorms, heights, dogs, the sea, and infections. Fear of the latter is perhaps not surprising in somebody born in Ireland in 1882, which meant that he grew up with people who had living memories of the famine, when cholera and other diseases had killed on such a massive scale. Indeed, recurring flu epidemics and pervasive tuberculosis were part of Joyce's world since childhood. We recall that five of his siblings never made it to adulthood. For people of that era then, and especially for Joyce with his superstitions and phobias, a consciousness of the intangible and invisible forces that could suddenly strike at life was close to being normal. But given the sheer scale of the atrocities of the war, and especially the rapid and destructive power of the Spanish flu, it still might be expected that some such realities might have somehow made their way into Joyce's text. I should note that when I teach Ulysses, I tell my students that engaging with this novel involves a kind of crash course in Western history and culture, as the illusions in the book send readers in search of literally thousands of references signaled within its pages. Indeed, the book which annotates all of Joyce's illusions in Ulysses is larger than Ulysses itself. Given this feature of Joyce's writing methods, 
a reader might expect that something of the moment in which he was writing might have impinged on the 1904 reality that is the temporal setting of the novel, that the chaotic, disruptive, and death-producing reality of World War I and the Spanish flu might have somehow made their way into Ulysses. Now, there is at least one moment in Ulysses when we might argue that the present reality of writing impinges on the temporal past of 1904 that the novel seeks to create. In the Hades episode, as Leopold Bloom is en route to Glasnevin Cemetery for Paddy Dignam's funeral, he thinks to himself, quote, Scarlatina, influenza epidemics, canvassing for death. Don't miss this chance, end of quote. Joyce actually published the first version of this episode of Ulysses, the Hades section, in September 1918, just as the influenza pandemic was beginning to take hold. He was sheltering in Zurich from World War I when the, fan the, the Spanish flu caused the death of one of the group of amateur actors he was associated with. In Bloom's reflection in this passage, he associates pandemics such as influenza and scarlet fever with publicity campaigns. But the phrases canvassing for death and don't miss this chance are perhaps not so surprising coming from Bloom, the ad salesman. But the choice of language cannot disguise the meaning of its content. That premature death is being normalized, that diseases such as scarlet fever and influenza resemble and indeed embody the external forms and invisible elements that shape our existence. As I say, this very brief passage might be seen as Joyce's only gesture of acknowledgement of what was happening around him as he wrote sections of Ulysses. In fact, when it came to the war, Joyce often projected an image of someone who was indifferent to, and at times facetiously even, even ignorant of the unfolding carnage of the war. He was a pacifist and made this clear in various public writings during the war. He also had to contend with the consequences of the war in a very serious matter when, as a British subject, he was forced to leave Trieste, then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The irony that the nominal British identity of this very Irish writer would cause such disruptions in his life was not lost on Joyce. And indeed, he had to continue to, to deal with the demands caused by the disruptions of the war after he had settled in Zurich. So it is clear that World War II was the source of serious anxiety for Joyce and his family. When we reflect on Ulysses from the perspective of our lockdown conditions and social isolation, we are reminded dramatically and perhaps very enviously that this is a novel of movement, of being out and about. Stephen and Bloom are on the move all the time. Indeed, Leopold Bloom might be viewed as the flaneur par excellence moving through the streets of Dublin on his perambulations, acknowledging and reacting to the physical, material, and social world. And while as a Jew, he remains the ultimate outsider in Dublin, his generous and sociable nature allows him to derive various small consolations and reassurances from individual encounters. His freedom of movement means 
He covers a great distance from morning to night on this day. And I'm sure somewhere, if they haven't done it already, a Joycean scholar will calculate the number of miles that Bloom walked on June 16, 1904. A different resonance is created for us when we reflect that the purpose of Bloom's journey is a quest and as such becomes a major structural device in the novel. From the time he leaves home in the morning and returns home at night, his movement through the streets, whether to the library, the hospital, the pub, the brothel, can be seen ultimately as a search for Molly and home. It is a quest to achieve, to achieve a sense of communion, of belonging, which might relieve the terrible isolation he feels. In reflecting on this expanded notion of home, I was reminded of a recent podcast I listened to of Eleanor Wachtel on the CBC, interviewing Martha Ackman, who has written a recent biography of Emily Dickinson, the 19th century writer who was known as the poet of solitude. Living all her life in Amherst, Massachusetts, Dickinson was considered something of a recluse who had few friends, never married, and had no desire to travel, even to adventure much outside her, her home. In response to a question by Wachtel on Dickinson's concept of home, Ackman said that Dickens' idea of home was what she described as, quote, the wild terrain of her mind that she did not need to travel because going to her desk to write was enough. Ackman goes on to say that for Dickinson, home was ideas, home was thought, home was words, home was consciousness, and ultimately home was what it felt to be alive. While we who are spending so much time currently in our homes may be somewhat envious of Dickinson's self-sufficiency, the expanded concept of home here reminds us in some ways of Bloom's quest. While Bloom's quest for home and Molly may not necessarily be viewed as literally successful, the image of the two of them in bed, head to toe, during Molly's soliloquy that night is a powerful one of at least one dimension of the fulfillment of Bloom's quest, namely the need for physical contact. This multiple impulse for tactile contact, the desire for human communion at the most essential level is something which we as readers in our present reality of separation and so social isolation can appreciate all too readily. Ulysses shows then that Joyce understood this need and indeed his rendering of this fundamental human impulse is not one of the, the merely overarching features of the novel but is one of its primarily, uh, primary structural devices. Despite Joyce's radical break with literary traditions and conventions, despite the pyrotechnics and relentless experimentation in narrative modes, Ulysses remains a novel focused on character and the representation of those characters is achieved in profoundly ordinary ways. It is revealing, for example, the number of times his characters are excited by touching, how much they desire it, need it, feel they want it. Perhaps more than in any other way, the manner and frequency with which Ulysses explores 
this basic need in these characters, this desire to connect emotionally, physically, sexually, even intellectually with each other is what we in our lockdown isolation and social distancing can most identify with. To conclude then, even though Joyce's novel was written in the period when the carnage, horrific events, and unprecedented social and political upheavals were taking place in Western society because of the war and the Spanish flu, there are no references in the text to these earth-shattering occurrences. Yet it is possible, I believe, to a re respond to a core element of Ulysses as a powerful antidote to such existential threats to humanity. By focusing on one seemingly uneventful day and the mundane, even banal details in the lives of ordinary characters, the novel foregrounds the fundamental and eternal verities that constitute our humanity in delineating in multiple and sometimes searingly painful details the core elements of what it means to be human, how to function in a cohesive manner, reinforcing and sustaining social networks. It is this intrinsic and fundamental characteristic of Ulysses that can resonate for us in our current surreal circumstances. Thank you for joining us today and thank you for your attention. After hearing your presentation, the links to the present pandemic and our being locked down to Hill events shows that Ulysses has continuing relevance on a personal note, you mentioned the pandemic of 1914, 1918. My great grandfather was one of the people who died in that pandemic. So I have sort of a connection going back to that. Your erudition is evidence that you are in a long lineage of Irish scholars. We now know who you belong to. Thank you very much, Michael, for your presentation. As usual, Kevin, so eloquent, such a beautiful way of acknowledging Michael. Um, great, so thanks again, Michael, for bringing James Joyce, the man and his work uh, to life in our own times. I also want to introduce Miles Murphy. Uh, he's our liaison with the School of Irish Studies. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thank you, great. Um, so as I, as I list the upcoming events, you are going to see a series of photos from Festival Bloomsday events from past years, when we were able to gather freely, share a laugh and a jar with an insouciance that seems absolutely unheard of today, given the circumstances in the present lockdown. After three months here in Montreal, um, now, all times that I'm listing are in Eastern Daylight Time. We hope that you'll join us live. And all the events are recorded. And will you can see them at any time from our, uh, from our website, through our YouTube channel. Um, OK, so the very first item tomorrow is a concert hosted by Dennis Trudeau with 12 artists whom I know you're going to love. Now, Dennis Trudeau, I bet you remember him. He's a broadcaster and journalist. And then uh, that's, on, uh, that's tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Then on Sunday at 10 o'clock, we present a brand new film of one of Donovan King's res renowned historical walking tours in Montreal. Donovan, our filmmaker, Sid, and our musician, Kate, will be happy to answer questions afterwards. Now, in the afternoon, that Sunday afternoon at 2, one of Montreal's treasures, the exuberant Colleen Curran, playwright and entertainer extraordinaire, will read from her new play, The Sunset Gals. 
and a couple of other works as well. And that will also be followed by a question and answer period. Then on Monday at 10 a.m., the distinguished international academic panel that Miles has assembled will gather to discuss aspects of James Joyce's endlessly fascinating novel, Ulysses. Tuesday is the big day, June 16th, Bloomsday, as Kevin was describing. We'll have readings from Ulysses. One reader will be zooming in from South Africa, none other than Maurice Podbury, founder and longtime artistic director of Montreal's Centaur Theatre. Now, last but not least, will be the final chapter of Ulysses, Molly Bloom's Reverie, with words and song by Kathleen McAuliffe, Geraldina Mendes, and myself. Now, what do you think about when you're lying in bed unable to sleep on a hot summer night? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, in Molly's unforgettable words, I say, yes. I said, yes, I will, yes. You won't want to miss it. Thanks again, and see you tomorrow for the concert. <laughs>